Well, thank you. Thank you all very much for being here. Uh, thanks to Rob. He's backstage right now, but that was a fantastic talk and very sobering. Uh, I was popping some Prozac in the middle of that uh, whole talk. So, um, anyway, we're, we're going to do a little bit more sobering talk now, uh, talking about five common errors in shock. And this is largely, in fact, all of the lectures that I'm going to be doing today that Paul asked me to do have largely to do with errors. And a lot of these errors are my own. In fact, I have this poster in my home office. Some of you have seen this before, but it's just a reminder of what my life is really all about. The caption here, mistakes. It could be that the purpose of your life is only to serve as a warning to others. And that's <laughs> pretty much how I feel. Anyone out there feel the same way? So yeah, you know, it's good to learn from your, your own mistakes. It's even better to learn from other people's mistakes. So please take notice of the things I'm going to talk about. So anyway, just five errors as we go through this that I've learned really the hard way through my 20-some years of practice. Number one, failure to consider the differential diagnosis for hypotension and shock. That seems pretty simple, right? Well, when somebody is hypotensive, what is your differential? What are the things that you think about as potential causes of their hypotension? Probably a lot of you, and, and I did also, a lot of us learned to think about three big categories of shock. There's hypovolemic, there's obstructive, and there's distributive. And to tell you the truth, I can never remember what, what are the different types of distributive shock and what are the different types of obstructive shock. And for me, I like to really, really dumb things down and make things very simple, especially at 2 o'clock in the morning when you're tired and also there's a certain level of stress because somebody is crashing and you weren't expecting that. So what I did a number of years ago, I came up with a very simple mnemonic called shock. What better mnemonic for shock? When somebody's hypotensive, I just think through each of these things. Every one of these letters stands for two things. All right, so I hate mnemonics where some letters stand for one thing and some stand for three things. So every one of these stands for two things. All right, so S, septic and spinal. Every time you see a hypotensive person, you've got to think about these two possibilities and rule them out. H, hypovolemic and hemorrhagic. All right, pretty simple. Obstructive, tamponade, and massive PE. Get that ultrasound out. I suppose you could add tension pneumothorax to obstructive also, but you know, you're going to pick that up with your x ray. All right, <laughs> and then cardiogenic. Cardiogenic, two types, of, two types of C, cardiogenic, and also compartment syndrome. That's one of the causes that I always forget about. So if there's people out there that don't know about abdominal compartment syndrome, it is an increasingly recognized cause of shock. It's something that you've got to think about, especially in the trauma patient, especially any patient that's getting large volumes of resuscitation. If you don't know what abdominal compartment syndrome is, it's something that we'll, maybe we'll have to have a talk about next year or look it up when you get back home but it is a, uh, an increasingly recognized cause of shock. And then K, you'll have to grant me a little bit of license with this K. The K stands for endocrine. <laughs> it's the best I could do. And anaphylactic, all right? And again, endocrine, I don't even know where endocrine fits in the hypovolemic obstructive distributive, but it's something you've got to think about. And also anaphylactic, which is a type of distributive shock, but invariably everyone forgets about the possibility of anaphylactic. We had a patient just a couple of months ago in our emergency department who went over for CAT scan, came back from CAT scan. I don't even know what the person was being up, worked up for. And about an hour after the CAT scan, she dropped her blood pressure and nobody could figure out what was causing the hypotension. We're running through obstructive and distributive and people are ultrasounding the chest and belly. Nothing's coming out. And then we run through this mnemonic and think, well, could this be anaphylactic? Well, the patient just came back from CAT scan and just got contrast Maybe it's anaphylaxis to the contrast. We know about 10, 15% of anaphylaxis has no rash. So we said, what the heck? Forget the norepi, which the patient was on. Stop the norepi. Let's just give an EpiPen shot, which was what we have in the ED. We give a shot of epi and bam, the blood pressure came right back up. Turned out the patient was having anaphylaxis to the contrast and nobody thought of it except simply going through this mnemonic. Now you could add a D there as well, shocked. And D is just a reminder to think about some of the drugs that we use as well, all right? So this is a really great mnemonic, and honestly, it seems very simple. It seems very medical schoolish, but again, at one o'clock in the morning, when the shit's hitting the fan and you're stressed and you can't think right, you need simple things, and this will take you through pretty much all the potential causes of hypotension with your patients. So use it. Use it. It's a lot better than that whole distributive obstructive thing. All right, number two, over-reliance on systolic blood pressure instead of the MAP. It's important to remember that we live two-thirds of our life 
in diastole. Think about that for a second. Two-thirds of your life, of my life, is spent in diastole. So diastolic blood pressure is actually more important than systolic blood pressure. And as a result, when you calculate the MAP, the diastolic blood pressure gets double credit. So when you want to calculate MAP, it's systolic plus diastolic plus diastolic averaged over three. All right, so that's my simple way of remembering the MEP. Systolic plus diastolic plus diastolic over three. Diastolic is twice as important as systolic blood pressure. Take a look at this example. Who's got better perfusion? Most people just glance at this and say, well, it's the person with the blood pressure of 110. Wrong. The patient with the higher diastolic has better perfusion when you run out the numbers. All right, so it's a simple example. We don't pay enough attention to diastolic blood pressure, and that's why MAP is more important than systolic. I would be content if we completely got rid of systolic blood pressures and just talked about MAPs or even just diastolic blood pressure. But please give more uh, credence to the diastolic blood pressure or even better, the MAP. All right, number three, lackadaisical approach to managing shock. How often have you been working in the emergency department and you had somebody who's hypotensive and you write an order for some fluids and then you come back an hour later and you know what, they're still hypotensive and you give some more fluids and you come back an hour later and they're still hypotensive, it happens all the time. Maybe not to you, but I'm sure all of you have colleagues that do that, right? So. That's a terrible approach to shock, and I've been guilty of this many, many times. Please remember that when a person is hypotensive, when they're hypoperfusing, every minute that they're hypoperfusing, they are infarcting their brain, their gut, their heart, and their kidneys. You need to think of things in those terms because that's the only way you will remember to treat shock aggressively. The longer a patient has a low MAP, the higher the morbidity and mortality. Hypotensive kills, hypotension kills patients. We cannot afford to let them stay hypotensive. So the next question is, you start some fluids on the patient, when do you switch over to pressors? Nobody's really given us some good guidelines about, you know, how much fluid should we try before we switch to pressors? Or probably more importantly, how much time should we allow fluids to go in before we switch to pressors? You know, if you have a large bore IV, you can give a liter in probably 20, 30 minutes or so. But if you have one of those little 27 gauge between the fourth and fifth metacarpal, you know, that might take an entire day to give a liter. And yet you're saying, well, we just need to give more IV fluids, no, because that patient is infarcting while you're waiting. There's a couple of studies that came up with very similar results to this one representative one that I'm putting up here. Please think about this. For every hour delay in treating shock in this study, for every hour delay that they didn't give norepi, the mortality increased by 5%, right? Now, I'm not telling you to start norepi as soon as they hit the door, but don't wait long for treating that hypotension. I know some critical care experts who, in their practice, they'll start the IV fluids, and if a patient's not turning around with the IV fluids within the first 30 minutes, they start the norepi. They start the norepi at 30 minutes. And then, as more fluids go in, if the blood pressure starts coming up, they titrate down the norepi. What's the harm with adding a little bit of norepi initially when we know that there's tremendous harm with every 10, 15, 30 minutes that goes by that the patient is persistently hypotensive. The early administration of norepinephrine decreases or improves lactate clearance, and also, the earlier you start the norepi, the shorter the total duration that they end up needing to be on norepi. So they turn around a lot faster. Again, I'm not telling you to start norepi as soon as they hit the door, but don't wait that long before you start adding additional management for their hypotension, all right? Uh, also, let's bring some cardiac stuff in here. I don't know why it is, but we as acute care physicians don't like shocking patients who really need to be shocked, right? I, there's a lot of people that you would say don't need to be shocked that I would just like to go up to and shock. But, you know, with a lot of these patients, right? Don't hesitate to cardiovert them. Even when they have borderline blood pressures, don't hesitate cardio. It's the best, fastest, and safest therapy that we have for unstable tachydysrhythmias. Don't putz around with medications in these patients, even the borderline hypotensive patients. You know, sometimes people say, well, let me give a little diltiazem or maybe titrate a little beta blocker. Forget it. Just go right to cardioversion, 
all right, sedate them and cardiovert them. Let's take VTAC as an example. The EKG you're looking at up here was an 81-year-old, by the way, nursing home patient with a blood pressure of about 95 to 100, and she's got ventricular tachycardia. She's 81 years old, she's borderline blood pressure, and the physicians that were taking care of her didn't want to shock her, all right? She had no mental status. Why not? She's not going to complain. Just shock her. It's going gonna, it's gonna to get the blood pressure back, all right? And if she would complain, give her some sedation and then shock. They ended up giving her medications. They gave her some beta blockers, and she crashed and burned. We talked about this yesterday in the course. All right, if you look at the international guidelines, guidelines put together by the ACC, the AHA, and the European Society of Cardiology, they all got together and they came up with the guidelines for how to treat ventricular arrhythmias. Cla uh, procainamide, class 2A. Amiodarone, class 2B. Class 1 was sedate and shock. It is the only class 1 therapy for ventricular tachycardia, all right? And yet, we all want to go to medications. Don't do that. Don't wait on this. All right. What else? Number four, overzealous fluid administration. Well, a lot of patients don't respond to fluid. In fact, we can actually make patients worse. PE is your classic example. And for those of you that are good with your ultrasound, you've got to get out that ultrasound. Take a look at the heart. And when you see somebody who's got a PE, they are going to do worse with IV fluid administration. All right, so take a look at me for just a second. This is a nice model, and Peter W. gets credit for doing this. He taught me this. So think about my head and neck as the interventricular septum, all right? Here is the right ventricle. Here is the left ventricle. I'm sure this is going to go on Twitter. All right, so <laughs> here's the left ventricle. When a person's got a PE, they have an obstruction to flow to the, the lungs. So what happens? The right ventricle gets distended, pushing the LV into pushing the inner ventricular septum into the left ventricle, decreasing LV filling, and as a result, the person gets hypotensive. That's why your massive PE patients get hypotensive, all right? Now, what happens when you give that person a 500 cc bolus of fluid? Where does it go? Right ventricle, which distends this even more, pushes the septum over even more, making the LV even smaller and LV output even smaller, so a nice little pearl, if you ever give a fluid bolus to somebody and they drop their pressure, think about pulmonary embolism. And these are patients that definitely shouldn't be getting more fluid. Go right to pressors. When in doubt about anybody about whether they're fluid responsive, studies have shown that passive leg raise is the best predictor of whether somebody is going to be fluid responsive or not. Raise the legs up. And that's like giving your patient a 250 to 500 cc bolus of fluid. Take a look at the IVC when you raise the legs up and see what happens. And you'll know whether that patient's fluid responsive. If, they, if the IVC gets bigger, then they're probably gonna be more fluid responsive. If the IVC is plump already, more fluids is not gonna help that patient. And then finally, failure to appreciate the shock index. You know, as an emergency physician, I never really learned about shock index. It's in Tintinale and Rosen, but the critical care people are all over this. And it's starting to make its way into the emergency medicine litter. What, what is shock index? It's heart rate over blood pressure, or systolic blood pressure, right? I'm not happy they use systolic, but whatever, right? Normal should be less than 0.7. If the heart rate is higher than the blood pressure, then intuitively you know that's a bad sign. But studies have looked at this shock index and correlated shock index as being in sepsis as good as SIRS at predicting adverse outcomes. It's also the most specific predictor of hyperlactemia and 28-day mortality. It's a very, very helpful, simple calculation. Shock index in sepsis has also been helpful at predicting adequacy of our resuscitation attempts and also development of organ failure and mortality. And it's also important in your intubated patients. As a general rule, when you intubate, if you take a look at all patients intubated in emergency departments, about 1% to 2% of patients that get intubated in the ED will crash right after the intubation. They'll suddenly drop their blood pressure or have cardiac arrest. We've all seen that before. If you haven't, you haven't done enough intubations, all right? It's a common thing. You know, 1% to 2%, not terribly common, but you practice long enough, you'll see patients crash after their intubation. The most predictive the, the, the best predictor of whether your patient is going to get intubated and crash is the shock index. So take a look at that shock index, and if that shock index is greater than 0.8, don't intubate yet. 
you need to resuscitate that patient before you intubate. People say resuscitate before you intubate. This is a fantastic predictor of which patients need to be resuscitated before you put that tube in. So quick summary, again, always consider that full differential of shock. MAP is more important than systolic blood pressure. Respect the diastolic blood pressure. Be aggressive about reversing shock. Fluids are good, but use that passive leg raise. And finally, keep the shock index in mind, especially before any intubations you do, you ought to be looking at the shock index. And if it's high, then you ought to be resuscitating them first. All right. Thank you all very much. I'll be back in a little bit. <laughs>